And uh, to begin with, we'll talk about rations. Well, every day we receive three boxes of K rations. And one box, and we had a breakfast, a lunch, and a dinner. And every, uh, we had, for like for breakfast, we had chopped eggs, scrambled eggs. For lunch, we had cheddar cheese. And for, wow, we have full house today. And for dinner, we had beef, uh, chopped beef. And every day, it was the same thing. We had the same breakfast every day, month after month. You know, no change. So once in a while, we'd get a little pepper or something, and we'd just try to mix it up a little bit just to make it a little change. But anyway, we had, and we had, uh, we, I'll tell you what we always had. We always had water. We never ran short of water, and we never ran short of ammunition. So there was no problem with that. But, uh, and cigarettes. Wow, we had cigarettes by the ton. Uh, because every day, in, in every one of those packages, there would, would be four cigarettes. Four, four, and four. So we had 12 cigarettes in every day. And I, not that it was doing a heck of a lot of good, but uh, and then we also had uh, some crackers. And one, uh, like once we'd have a, a, a fruit bar, sometimes a chocolate bar, one or the other. And then we had the marvelous dextrose tablets. They were supposed to be for vitamins. And when we ate them, they tasted like chalk. I bet. So, yeah. we, so we, we never really ate them. And, uh, and what else did we have? Um, just lo lots, of, just lo lots of cigarettes. I mean, you know, I don't know whether the United States was paying the cigarette companies for those cigarettes, but they shouldn't have because the cigarette companies would love it because we were young kids, 18, 19. Some, of, some kids never smoked, but you got <coughs> four cigarettes every, you know, eight, 12 cigarettes every day. You sit in your foxhole. What else are you going to do? You're going to smoke in these. A lot of young kids that didn't smoke before began smoking. See, so they, they were really getting customers. They, they, the cigarette company should have given them gladly yeah. because, because I remember later on when, it, when we were at college, the, the cigarette company used to come up and give out free cigarettes. Here, take four little packs of cig cigarettes. They just wanted to get you in as a customer. Okay, so there are the K rations. Now, uh, we're still, we're still in the hedgerows. We're back in the hedgerows, remember? So anyway, I'll tell you about the early hedgerows anyway. We were uh, uh, advancing about 100 yards a day. And uh, uh, one, one time, now, we, we always fought during the day, mornings usually, and sometimes the afternoon, but we never fought at night. And the Germans didn't like to fight at night either. So we really never had any night fighting. It was always day fighting. So on this one, for this one particular night, I don't know why, but we were told to move forward. And uh, what happened was uh, we were still in the hedgerows, and there was a company on our left, and there was our company on our right, and there was a narrow road, and I, and I was told to stay in the narrow road, and then I had to look at this company here moving up, and, I, and as they move up, I waved to my, to my company. It was uh, my good friend, Bill, the, uh, he's the first lieutenant. I, I'd wave him on, and then I'd move up, and, and I'd look in front, looking, uh, move up, move, move. Then I'd say, wait, wait, you know, because this company, they'd stop, and I'd say, move and move. Well, you know, in France, uh, around 12 o'clock midnight, there's still a little bit of visibility. I think the northern stars are up there, and there's still some little visibility. Whereas in, uh, in the United States here, when it's 12 o'clock at night, it's black. Well, we could see a little bit. So I'm walking along and looking at this company and waving here, and all of a sudden, I fell in a hole. <laughs> Gee, I fell in a hole. And it was, you know, I, I fell in, and it was very soft, and I started to sink and sink, and I was saying, it's a uh, quicksand. 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 I thought. I said quicksand. I said I only. I thought quicksand was only in the desert. How could quicksand? I didn't know they had quicksand here. And I'm sinking down. I'm staying. Well, stay. Well, stay still. 
you know, I read, if you stay still, you're okay. But I kept going lower and lower. I said, forget that. And I started kicking myself out. And finally, I did get out of the hole. So then, then I, I was behind. So then I had to run up, you know, as, as quickly as I could all up. And I fi finally saw my friend Bill, the lieutenant. He said, where the hell were you? He didn't know I fell in the hole. So I fell behind. And then, so we, we moved up. So that was the only time, really, that we did anything that was uh, uh, not in daylight. So I just told you a little bit about that. OK, so uh, I, I want to tell you, too, remember, remember I said to you that uh, on July 25th, I saw the planes coming over, and I said, they were bombing St. Lowe, and then 51 years later, when I went back to France and met the Frenchman, and I said to him, well, uh, I was at St. Lowe, and I saw the planes b bombing St. Lowe on July 25th. He said, George, he said, they didn't bomb, they weren't bombing St. Lowe. They didn't bomb St. Lowe. They were bombing an area about seven miles past St. Lowe because they were to try to get a hole in the German line. So that was a mistake I made. So what, what I'm getting at is that, see, if, if I had told this story, let's say I'm, I'm talking to you today. Now, if you, let's picture that you, all of us, are on that hill uh, lo overlooking St. Lowe. So we see the planes coming over, and we're all looking. We see the bombs coming down. And then the next day, uh, we, next day we go down the hill and we go into St. Lowe, all the buildings are level. What would you think? You'd say, yeah, that's St. Lowe. And then years later you find out it's not St. Lowe. Okay, well, you know, I'm, like, I'll give you, I'll give, give you an example. Later on I'm going to tell you about when Patton's army got into Czechoslovakia and when I met the first Russians. And I'm going to tell you where I met the Russians and what we did. And, and then after, uh, look, if, I won't be around 10 or 15 years from now, but p maybe for 10, for you people will be around 10 years from now, and you'll, and you'll read, no, Patton didn't meet those Russians there. They were Hungarians, <laughs> see? So, so you know, what I'm, what I'm trying to tell you exactly what happened, but sometimes uh, you don't know, you, you don't realize what the truth really is. You assume so. So that didn't happen. I hope you guys are around 10 years from now. All right. Uh, okay, I told you about the quicksand. Oh, yeah. The foxholes. Now, the foxholes were only about that deep and just long enough for your body to be in there. And uh, we always built our foxholes as far apart as we could because one thing you don't want to do is be together, see? Uh, like I'm, whenever we took a town and we'd walk down the street, see, we'd always be separated. Uh, like I'd be here, and there'd be another soldier there, and another one, but we never got together, you know, because if you get together, that's where you're gonna get killed. Because if, 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 a, uh, if a German is there, and he's looking, he sees three men close together, he's gonna shoot at the three men instead of the single man. He might miss the single man, but if they're three men together, he's bound to hit one or two of them. So we always tried to stay apart. And he, so really, we did little conversing, really, among ourselves. The only time we conversed was when we were in reserve. And we, here's the way reserve two worked. If, if two platoons are on the line, one platoon is in, rever, in reserve. If two companies are on the line, one company is in reserve. Just in, so we advance, and then if the Germans counterattack, you got that other platoon to help you. See, so we would, we would occasionally get into uh, reserves. And when we got in reserve, that's when we could talk together and, and uh, have, have a smoke together. And sometimes uh, we would try to wash ourselves. We'd get our, they'd have little, we had little packages. We'd brush our teeth when we were in reserve. So we, we could only do that when we were in reserve. Now I'm gonna jump a little ahead of myself because I want you to understand this. I'm gonna jump ahead to after the bulge. And then later on, I'll come back and I'll tell you from the beginning of the bulge. But after the bulge, all of us had trench feet because we never took our shoes off and our, our feet were sopping. So then we, we finally, uh, 
After the Battle of the Bulge, we finally got into reserve, and we took our shoes off for the, for the first time in a long time, and uh, our feet were really soggy. I'll tell you how bad they were. Do you know that Dr. Scholes, you know how, what Dr. Scholes looks like? It's about that thick? Well, double, d double that. Double the d Dr. Scholes, and it's about that thick? Well, that's what the bottom of our feet were like, and we took them off. We pulled them right off our feet. They were about that thick and spongy and rubbery-like. And we were waving them in the air. Look at mine. <laughs> and we were waving them at each other. So, so what happened was we lost the bottom of our feet, really. That's a cushion that you have on the bottom of your feet. But when we took these off, we lost that. So when we walk around now, like right now, if I step on a little tiny pebble, I can feel it, right, it goes right, right into my nerve. I don't have that cushion anymore. And, and I used to get that when I used to go on the beach. I, some of the young kids would just walk on the stones and think nothing. And, oh, and I'd be, you know, so careful because I felt the pain coming right up through. I didn't have that little cushion there. So we lost that. Uh, you know, some of the other things, uh, oh, I'll, later on I'll tell you about lice. Not now. <laughs> I'll tell you about lice. Okay, so let's see. We're still in, well, here, here's some of the things that happened too. When we walk into a town, I told you, uh, we'd walk up, uh, walk, up, walk up the center of the street and the, and the girls would kiss us and the guys would give us the wine and, and you know that. Well, sometimes, sometimes we, didn't even, we didn't even fight to get that town. Like another company would come in and take the town and we'd follow them <laughs> and they'd be cheering for us. They thought we took the, the town. So... We would go into the town. Now, sometimes we'd go into town and, and this would happen. We would liberate the town and then the town would go out and get the girls who were fraternizing with the Germans because they oh, hated that. No. And they'd shave their heads, no. shave them, and they'd take their clothes off and the only thing they had on were the panties and bras. And sometimes they didn't have bras on. And they'd march them down the middle of the street, the, the first row, and there'd be a drummer in the back banging to, to make the people alert, and the people would come, come out, and the, girl, the young girls would be walking with their heads down, their shame, and, and the women would be saying words to them that we didn't understand, but we had an idea what the words meant. And, uh, and uh, it, uh, they would just walk them down the street, and it was very embarrassing for them, but uh, the, that's, the French got angry because they were fraternizing with the uh, Germans. One time when we didn't see people for a long time, one time one of the guys said, look, I see a girl, a girl, let's see. And we looked, there was, a, there was a man standing there and there was someone with a blue dress. We couldn't tell if she was eight years old or 80 years old. <laughs> So we just looked, a woman, we all took a look, because it's the first woman we've seen in quite a while. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's crazy, but uh, here we, sometimes we didn't see a woman for, but, but you know what, one, only one time they issued us condoms. Oh, no. Yes, they gave us condoms. And we didn't see a woman we, for like for two or three months. So, so you know what we did with them? We gave them to the riflemen, for the guys who had the M1 rifles, because whenever they, whenever they walked, they would have their rifle over the shoulder, and they'd have the uh, barrel pointing up, and if it rained, the water would go in the barrel. So they put the condoms <laughs> over, over, the, over the rifle. And, uh, and sometimes we'd walk into town, and they'd, you know, we'd write, and they'd have their rifles up there with the condoms, and the women would go, Gumi, Gumi. <laughs> Oh, uh, okay. Uh, what, oh, what else? Yeah, this happened another time in, in, in France. Uh, we went into this house. It was an abandoned house. And we went in there. I said, maybe we can sleep in the house. So we went and looked around. And we went into this one room. And we saw a toilet bowl. And we saw a sink. And then we saw this other thing that was made of porcelain and hot and cold water. And we were saying... <laughs> What, what, what in the world is that? And we were trying to figure it out. We thought about it, and then finally we, we said, it's a foot bath. And we all agreed, and we said, it's, it's a foot bath. We're, no, we're 19 years old. We never saw anything like that. 
Okay. Uh, what else? Can, oh, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you some of the, there's one particular uh, fellow that we had in our outfit. It, oh, by the way, we only knew first names of people. We never knew their last names or of the soldiers. You know, uh, we'd have, say, two or three wounded, and we'd say, well, we need four replacements. The four replacements would come in, and what's your name? Tom, Joe, Frank, Harry. And that, we never asked the last name. We never knew the last name. Even, even later on when we were working together, we rarely knew someone's last name. We, we know whether they were from uh, uh, Ohio or Nevada, but uh, we rarely knew last names. So uh, it's a shame because sometimes, like the, uh, there was one fellow, Trump, whom I, I wish I could find him. I'll tell you a little. <laughs> Trump was, fear, he was fearless, really. Uh, he was a fearless guy. And he loved to go on night patrols. You know, night patrols are bad. What we did was at night we'd form a patrol, and this kid Trump loved to go on those night patrols, and he, we'd go in, infiltrate the enemy lines to listen to see where the tanks were or where the half tracks were, where the trucks were, and then we'd inform the artillery and they'd, they'd bomb that place. So. This kid Trump, he always liked, George, come on, come on, we're going on night patrol. He always liked to get me in the night patrol. <laughs> and I didn't want to go on those night patrols. So, but occasionally I'd go with him. And uh, the, 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 the night patrol, the, the worst thing about a night patrol is coming back. After you finish your night patrol and you want to go back to your unit, coming back to the line is very dangerous because they hear you, they hear a sound, and the, the guns are ready, they're, they're, they're ready to shoot in an instant. So it, we would have the password, something like uh, New York, and the, and the answer would be Yankees, or Babe, and the answer would be Ruth. You know, and we had Betty, and the answer would be Grable. See, so, 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 so sometimes, Sometimes it was difficult to get back to the lines because you have to make sure you remember because the, 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 most of the guys down the line were very trigger happy. They, had the, they were shooting in an instant. They hear a little sound and they were ready to start shooting. When you're fighting at night, you, you sometimes are killing your own men. You can't see the, you know, the Germans from the Americans. We, if we're fighting, it, it was difficult to see. and It was, it was too confusing. It was, too, it was just too confusing. Uh, when you're fighting on the front lines, it's sort of an orderly fashion, and uh, you just couldn't have, you could, at, night, at night it was too confusing, so the, German, the Americans nor the Germans fought at night. I'll tell you what, another thing we didn't have, we, we, we'd lose, I say, five men, and we'd say, we need five replacements, and the, the word would go out to the replacement depots, and the replacement depots, there were hundreds of men waiting to be called. So we said, we need five men, and five men would come. Every time we called and asked for men, we ne always got a white man. We never got a black man. See, the, the black men, most of the black men were in the quartermaster. We saw them driving trucks, uh, but they were never in the infantry on the front lines. So uh, well, that was uh, some decision that was made by the generals or whoever it was. Uh, they made that decision, and we had nothing to uh, say about that. Okay. Oh, yeah, this kid Trump. I'll tell you another thing about him, too. Uh, now, we all had helmets, and you have a, the helmet is steel. And we used to take our bath sometimes in that little steel helmet if we could get enough water. And uh, in, inside the helmet was a liner, a helmet liner inside, so that the liner fit on your head and then the, the metal was on top. So it looked something like this. See, this would be the steel helmet, and then inside here would be the helmet liner. See, that would be on your head. Well, this kid Trump had his helmet, and a bullet hole went right in here like this, it went all the way around here, and it came out here. And he had the hole in here, and he had the hole in here. And, it, and he never, it never hit his head. And uh, 
and they tried to give him a new helmet. Oh, no, no, he didn't want any, this is his lucky helmet. He wouldn't give up, the, he wouldn't give up that helmet. When, when Donna and I went back, you know, 51 years after D-Day, uh, and we met with the, freshman, uh, the Frenchman, he took us to his home, and in his home, he was, well, he, I guess he was a young kid at the time, and he was gathering uh, helmets and rifles and German helmets and all, and in his uh, cellar, in his basement, he had a lot, it was like a museum. He had all these different things, American things, German things, and, uh, and uh, what, the, what was the point I was trying to, oh yes, while we were there, and this is 51 years after the war, they found an American soldier. Really? Yeah. He was caught. You know what happened? I, he, was caught, he, uh, he was probably in a gully, and he was probably shot and killed. And he fell into this gully, and then uh, the, maybe there were heavy rains, and the heavy rains put earth over his body. He wasn't discovered for 51 years. And while we were there, they discovered that one, and of course, they notified the family that they, and they, because this kid was probably MIA, missing in action. So then finally the family knew, and I think they sent his body back to uh, the United, United States after 51 years. I'll tell you a little bit too about the soldiers who were on the front lines. Uh, you know, where there were Northerners and there were Southerners and Westerners and Easterners. Well, the Southerners really were better shots, really. They were they were excellent at firing guns, and they were very accurate. Uh, whereas the Northerners, like, I never saw a gun. I never fired a gun in my life until I got in the Army. So uh, I wasn't very accurate. In fact, when, with the rifle, I was very poor. And we went on the rifle range. I'll tell you about the rifle range, too. Maybe you don't know this. We'd go on the rifle range, and you'd fire. And uh, after you fired, someone in the pit back there would put up a little flag and it would say whether you got a, a three, a two, or a bullseye, see? And they'd show you that. If you missed the target completely, the, the flag would come up. It was Maggie's drawers. There were red, <laughs> not, red Maggie's drawers would come up if you missed. I missed many times. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, and another thing too about the Southerners. The Southerners knew if you killed an, like one time we killed a pig. Well, I had no idea how to dress the pig, or, but the Southerners knew how to dress the pig, they knew how to cook the pig, they knew everything. And they, they, about, they knew the same thing about, uh, what else did we have? Oh, fish. Uh, like one time, I'll tell you the way I went fishing. Uh, I, I found a pond, and I see the fish in there, and I find a little gully, and I sit in the gully, and I took a hand grenade, and threw it in the oh, pond, no. it would explode, and the fish, the dead fish would flow, and I'd run in there and get the fish, and, I, and I'd give it to the southern guys, because they knew how to clean it and how to cook it, so that we, we'd do that. <laughs> I, I was going to say this yesterday, and this young lady reminded me, I didn't say it, because it was something I'm ashamed of, really. Uh, you know, when you're on the battlefront like that, you, and you're, the Germans are killing your friends, and you see them drop dead in front of you, and you see them screaming in pain. You develop a, a hatred. You, you really, like, uh, uh, like Patton says, you know, when you see your friends die, you, you, you develop a hatred. And I had that hatred, and it was quite bad. And um, one time, uh, we were in the hedgerows, and uh, someone captured two German two Germans, they were prisoners. And uh, we said, I said, what's going on here? And they said, well, they captured two German prisoners and now they're waiting for someone to take them back to be interrogated. So th they didn't have anyone to go back. And I said to my friend, hey, why don't we volunteer to take them? We'll take them to the next hedgerow and we'll shoot them. Right. Oh, I'm, I'm really, no, that's, that's a horrible thing to do. You capture a prisoner, you don't, you don't do that. Nazis do that. And I didn't want to be a Nazi. So I was, I was ashamed of that. And I'll admit that. Okay, now I think we're ready for the uh, three days. You know, another thing too, I never think about the war. If I get up in the morning, I have breakfast, I have lunch, and I have dinner. I never think about the war. 
if I go to bed at night, I don't think it, I read a, I read a book and I fall asleep. If I wake up in the middle of the night and I have to go to the bathroom, when I come back, that's all I think about is the war. I can't think about anything else. And sometimes I think about it for an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, and finally I have to get a book and read a book to try to forget about it. And I read the book and, and then I fall asleep. But the only time I think about it is late at, late, late at night. All right, I call these the three days of terror. And this happened on three consecutive days, like Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. It didn't happen like one week and then two weeks. Like These are three days in a row that happened. Okay, this is day number one. And here's a street. And here's the street. And remember, when we walk down the street, here's the sidewalk here. Okay, we would walk along here. Just as we showed you on the board there, we would be separated. Uh, like there'd be one man here, one man here, one man here, and the same thing here, one here, one here, and here. And we'd be walking down the street like this, and, and this is a little town, and this is the, uh, the street, and these the sidewalks, and there is a stoop here or a porch. And we were walking down here like this, and all of a sudden, a machine gunner from back here opened up on us, and I, of course, we flopped into the street, face down, lying down flat in the street here, and this machine gunner was firing. And I was like lying right here, and there was another guy here, and then there were some men in here. I don't know, I couldn't see them because I was, had my head down anyway. And, and uh, the machine gunner was firing, and he was firing, and his, he would go with his machine gun here, and he'd fire and fire, and he'd come this way, and he'd come, and I'm, I'm lying down like this, and I can see him coming closer and closer. I see the bullets hitting the sidewalk and then hitting the building and ricocheting off to the left, and he kept coming closer and closer and closer and closer until I thought he was about two inches from my head, and he was still firing. Maybe, maybe he was four or five inches away from my head, but he was very close, and I could see the bullets going, hitting the sidewalk, hitting the wall, and then ricocheting off to the left. You know, I was telling this to a friend of mine, a civilian friend of mine, he said, George, he said, Hi, you can't see bullets when they're going by your head, they go so fast. I said, no, we didn't see the bullets, we saw the tracers. See, whenever a machine gun fires, if you have a rifle, you aim and you can hit something. But when you have a machine gun, you can't aim, so all you do is fire and you see where the bullets are going. And you see where the bullets are going because every fourth bu bullet is a tracer. So you're not seeing the bullets, you're just seeing the tracers. So you know where you're shooting. Well, that's what I saw. And he, he kept moving that machine gun over until he was right next to my head. And I was saying to myself, well, my mother is going to get a, a, an envelope KIA and uh, killed in action, and that'll be the end of it. And, and then he stopped, and then he moved back the other way, and he started firing at the other guys on the other side. And then he came back, and he was firing and come closer and closer. He came to the same spot, and I thought he was going to come uh, two inches more, and he would have hit my head. Well, he, he kept firing, and he stopped there, and to, to this day, I have no idea why he stopped. You know, I could come up with some possibilities, like maybe he was in a window and he could come across and, it, and then he hit the side of the window and he couldn't go anymore. Or maybe there was something wrong with the, uh, the mechanism that made him traverse and he was traversing and, and then it would hit him and he'd stop. So he stopped again. Now this time he went back again and, and then he started coming back and I, I said, no, I said, George, you're leaving. So I jumped up out of the street and I ran up to this stoop right here. See, let's see. Uh, yeah, how can I show you? Oh yeah, here, here. This was a wall. This was here was a, a cobblestone wall, so, uh, very solid. And there's the steps and there was a little door here and this was a hallway. So I ran up from here and I ran up the steps and I was in behind that wall and I was safe. So I stayed there and, uh, and then finally uh, the machine gunner stopped and he wasn't firing at all. I don't know where he went or when he went. And uh, 
there were a couple of wound, several wounded men out here, and we were about six or seven soldiers, maybe seven or eight soldiers in this area here, sitting here, up uh, up above the steps here, and uh, and one of the men was wounded, and and he was yelling for help. He wanted someone to come and help him. So we were we were all of us were there, and uh, finally he said, George, he called my. George, he said, help me. So the guys looked at me and said, he's calling you, George. <laughs> so, yes. So I ran down the steps, and I ran down here, and I picked him up by the shoulders. And I carried him up here. I carried him up the steps. And then I carried him into that hallway. And I went all the way down. It was, it was a very dark hallway. It had one light. And I carried him all the way down to the other end of the hallway, as far away from the trouble as possible. And uh, he, he told me where, you know, I said, can I help you? He said, oh, it's my stomach, my stomach. So I opened up his shirt, pulled his pants open, and he was hit in the stomach. Okay, now I'm going to take you back to the United States when we were in basic training in Kentucky. I'm, we're doing Kentucky now. So one day I'm coming out of the... Uh, a mess hall, walking down the stairs, walking toward the barracks, and there was an explosion in the barracks. And uh, we ran down there, we went in the barracks, and we saw several guys with little minor cuts, not deep cuts, but little minor cuts. And, they were, and then I saw this one, my good friend, uh, Jerry, was sitting on his, uh, his, uh, his, his, his supply box or his, a little, like a little container where he kept his clothes. It was about this, he was sitting on it. And uh, he said, oh, he said, my leg, you know, my leg. And uh, I lifted up his pants, I looked at his leg and he had a hole in his leg. So uh, uh, he, I, I, wanted, I, I didn't know what caused the explosion really. So I said, look, well, let's get out of here. And I picked him up and I carried him out of the barracks across a little walkway and into the day room. There's a day room there. And I put him on the floor, hoping that eventually the medics would come because I really don't know how to take care of him. So I was just looking at his leg and uh, you know, trying to keep him calm and, and, and not too, good, too excited. So uh, I'm waiting for the medics to come. And then he says, oh, he says, George, Oh, my stomach. Oh, my stomach. I said, oh, you know, you're nervous now. You, know, you got shot. You know, you got a hole in your leg and you're, and you're in pain. Oh, my stomach. My. He kept yelling about his stomach. So finally, I opened up his shirt and he had a hole in his stomach. So the medics finally came. They took him to the hospital and he was in the hospital and they took, you know, the doctors took care of it. I don't know why they did surgery on him, whatever they did. But... Uh, uh, after about a few days, we went to see him, and and he looked kind of sick, and uh, and then we went uh, about several, you know, whenever we got a chance, we went back to see him. And the next time we went back to see him, his mother was there and his sister was there, and uh, you know they hugged me and they said, well, thank you for you know carrying him out like that. And I said, well, yeah, you're welcome. And uh, and then we went on bivouac and we left. And we were gone for about a week on bivouac, so we couldn't get to see him. But when we came back from bivouac, we went to the hospital to see him again. When we got to the hospital, they told us, he's dead. No. You know, and geez, we said, well, he looked like he was recovering. You know, he looked like, a, how, what happened? And the doctor said, well, he was moved. He was moved, see. When, he said, whenever a, 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 a soldier is injured internally like that, the last thing you want to do is move him. You want to keep him as calm as... As soon as you lift him up, you, you, start, he, you start ripping the Indians and you carry him and you carry him up the stairs and you put him down and all of, you're, he, you're ripping his insides. So he died. Now this fellow here, I'm on the back of the hall and now he tells me he has a hole in his stomach. And I'm saying, oh, not again. So uh, in the meantime... Uh, our troops started to move out of the town. The Germans left, and we were moving, and uh, they came to me and said, you know, they knew I was down here, and they said, George, we're leaving, we're leaving. And he was, said, please don't leave me. Don't leave me, George. And I said, no, no, I won't leave you. And, and then another group came by, 
And finally, one of the, uh, uh, this, my friend Bill, the assistant, the lieutenant, he said, George, he said, the captain said it's a direct order. You have to go. Now, when you get a direct order and you're on the front line, you must obey. If you don't obey, they could put you in jail. They could possibly uh, shoot you. Uh, so I, I, he was begging me to stay with him, and I said, I can't. You know, this is a direct order. So I left him. I really never forgot leaving him there, and I left him in that hall, and I was hoping later that the medics would come along and take care of him, but I never heard anything more about him. So this is day one, and now we're going to go to day two. And that's all I have to do. Okay. So after we left this uh, little town, and we moved up on a hill, and uh, we dug our fo foxholes. It was very quiet and, and no, no problem at all. So we dug, dug our foxholes. And, uh, and, uh, and then this one fellow, his name was Bill, too. I was in my foxhole, and uh, he came to me to ask me something about what he was supposed to do next. And he was talking to me. Uh, let's see. You, you stand up, dear. He was turned around this way. He, he was here talking to me, and I was in my foxhole like this, and all of a sudden, I saw a hole in his forehead. Oh, a sniper no. shot him right in the forehead. It had to be a sniper because it was a perfect shot right here. Thank you. So he fell, he fell down, and uh, you know, I was so stunned, and, and then I realized I... Ducked down, I ducked down about two seconds after I ducked down, I heard a bullet going right over my head. So I had to stay in my foxhole because I couldn't get up because I knew that he was looking for me. So, so uh, I said, um, I said, I yelled to the other guys, I said, there's a sniper out there. And I said, look in those weeds, put some fire on those weeds. I was yelling to them, put some fire on those weeds. And they did, they were firing rifles at the weeds there. And uh, another time, I, I lifted my helmet up, and sure enough, a bullet went whizzing by. So I said, get some more fire on those woods. Uh, he's in those weed, weeds. And they kept firing and firing, and finally, we, they, were got up, they got up and they came to me, and then I got up and, and I realized that uh, something happened. Either they killed the, the sniper or he, uh, he escaped. So that was day number two. Okay, now we come to day number three. This is really an amazing day. All right, so we, when we took this, to, we went into this town, and we took this town for the first time, and uh, we assembled, and uh, the captain said, uh, you know, to me and to my uh, fellow uh, Bill uh, Lieutenant, he said, he said, get your platoons, uh, to set up machine gun outposts on this, on this end of town and a machine gun outpost on this end of town. He says, but not after the riflemen. First, the riflemen had to go through the house by house to make sure no Germans were, have, were waiting for us as we walked down the street. So they had to clear out the houses. So there were, the, the, the uh, riflemen went, went on each side of the road and cleaned out the houses. And then we're waiting, for, we were in a cellar, and the cellar was something like this. It had a, a, a window here, this is the street, this is a, one window, and there was a back door here, oh, the sliding door, and we were in this cellar. Oh, we were about, about 30, 30 men in there, maybe 20, 30, something like that, and uh, we were waiting for the riflemen to get, clear out the houses, and then we were gonna set up the machine guns. So what happened was, uh, we're, oh, by the way, in here, right here, there was a big pig, and he kept squealing. And the more, and the more nervous we got, the more he squealed. And then we heard, so, there was, uh, up above us, we heard a conversation like this. We heard uh, a German officer, we assume, talking to two civilians, a man and a woman. And they, I don't know, we couldn't understand what they were saying, but they were conversing, and then they were raising their voices and got louder and louder, and then finally two shots rang out, and it was silent. The argument was over. So here we are in, the, in this basement. 
And then, what, the next thing we saw, we, we looked out the window, and the, there were about 10 of the riflemen, 10, maybe 12 of the, of the riflemen. They were captured by the Germans, and they were across the street, here. They were up in here. There was like a wall there, and that's where they were, about 10, about 10 or 12 of them. And we looked at it, and he says, look, they have our guys out there. They captured them. They were prisoners. So uh, when we saw that, then we, uh, when we saw that, we said, let's get out the back door and see if we can get around. So we ran out the back door. When we went out the back door, a machine gunner opened fire on us, and we, went, we had to run back in again. We couldn't get out that back door. So here we are in the cellar. The pig is squealing, and they just killed all the Americans who were there. And then we're sitting here, and then we heard this clunk, clunk, clunk. And one of the guys got up, got up by the window and said, it's a German tank. And you know, I heard, I said, it was clunk, clunk. And they said, maybe it's a German tank. I said, no, it's one of ours. Relax, relax, because I could hear clunk, clunk, clunk. I could tell the difference between a German tank and an American tank. The, the, the uh, American tank went clunk, clunk, because the treads were made of rubber, see, and it would clunk. But the Germans had uh, tracks that were made of steel, and they made a clank, clank sound. So I could tell them, I said, oh, relax, it's one of ours. So then one of the guys looked out the window, he said, it's a German tank, and the tank was right here. I said, you know, this he's a young kid. You know, he doesn't know the difference between an American tank. So I go out here and I look out the window, and sure enough, it's a German tank. Not only is it a German tank, it's a huge, the biggest tank I, I had ever seen up until oh. that time. A Tiger Royal. It was a huge tank, big cannon on it, and there was a machine gunner uh, sitting up on the top. And uh, so we went, I went back in here again, and we were trying to decide what to do. So, I mean, this other uh, a friend of mine, Lieutenant, and I, we were the only officers there. And we said, well, what are we, what are we gonna do? And uh, we, did, we, 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 we know if we go out the back door, we got the machine gunner. If we, we, but we got this tank here, but so far, nothing is happening. But then, the tank started to move. And we were in here, and the pig is squealing, and everyone's so nervous, and we're all nervous, and it's chattering. And uh, so the tank, can we show how the tank moved down? Yep. Okay. Okay, yeah, the tank came from here, went all the way up to here, and there was like a little hill here. And the tank went up the hill, and then, go ahead, show more, Donna. And the tank, oh. yeah, the tank turned around, and the, 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 uh, the cannon was up this way, and then he lowered the tank, the, the, the cannon, and it was aiming right here for this window. And I said, if he shoots one, one of that 88 through the window, and it lands in here, it'll probably kill or wound, er, wound every man in there because the shrapnel explodes and you get this, and then it hits the wall and it bounces back and it hits the wall, so it would be, would it kill or wound almost everyone in that cellar. So we said, look, we're gonna get killed if we stay in here. I said, let's take a run. This guy, Bill and I, he said, let's go, come on, I told the guys, let's go, we'll go out the back door. And they were, no, no, the machine gun was there. I said, we've got to take a chance. So we, Bill and I and the two other guys ran out the back door, and the machine gunner didn't fire. We ran out the back door, and we ran, we started running this way. This is toward the American lines. And there was a hill like this, and we were running toward this hill, and the tank here, the, the machine gun on the top, so we, we could see him, and then he saw us, and he whirled this machine gun. I said, all we have to do is just get over this hill. It was a little snowy at the time. So we leaped over this hill, and he kept firing, and, and we, we were safe. We were flat on the ground, and he couldn't hit us. So then we crawled f for a while we, to keep low, and then finally when we, we, we were far enough, we got up and we start running toward, back toward the American lines. Now we were running back toward the American lines, we, we even left the 90th Infantry Division, and we ended up in the 4th Infantry Division. So we told them what happened. You know, we got stuck in the cellar, and we ran out. And uh, so we joined up with the 4th, and we stayed with them for, oh, about two or three weeks uh, until we, uh, 
met up with the 90th Infantry. They told us, and the guy put us in a jeep and he took us back, back to our outfits. The men that they, uh, they captured here, that's one of the reasons too. The machine gun on his tank before he left, he shot all of them. He killed all the Americans that were captured. So, you know, I couldn't tell with, uh, whether they were SS or not. Uh, probably, if they were killing the Americans, they were probably SS troops. No, I'll tell you what. I would go to 90th Infantry Division meetings, you know, years later, and I'd always ask, I'd say, I'd say was, well, you know, there were 90th Infantry Division, and then I would get to the 358th Regiment, which I was in, and I'd go to the meeting there, and I'd say, hey, were any of you guys in the cellar with the pig and the, and the German tank? And they'd say, no. And then I'd meet with another group, and I'd say, hey, same thing. Were you ever in the cellar with the pig and the tank? And No, I never met anyone. Now, I don't know what happened to the men. I don't really know. Maybe they all got, if that, uh, uh, if that cannon, if he had fired a shell in that, in that cellar, they were gone. They, were, they didn't have a chance. So I don't know whether they were all killed or what happened. So I really don't, I couldn't answer for that. Yeah. Shortly after that, we went out and we were still in the hedgerows and we, we were running across a hedgerow and I got hit in the hip, it was a, an 88, and I was sent back to the hospital and uh, I was only there about 10 days, but there were 10 beautiful days, really. <laughs> yeah. I was sleeping in a nice bed. I had a roof over my head. We had warm food. We had breakfast and we had nurses. Oh, we, <laughs> nice to see the nurses. So uh, that was 10, I had 10 great days there, hot food. And then finally, uh, we were leaving the hospital and, uh, as we left the hospital, there was a, uh, an officer out there, I think he was a major, and uh, he, ha he held us up and said, well, you know, how many of you have been in combat? You know, how long have you been in combat? He had his questions. A and then finally he said, well, how about you and you and you? And he pointed to about uh, three of us. Uh, and he said, uh, how would you like to uh, uh, be a guard for, for Patton. And we said, a guard for Patton? That means we won't be on the front? Yeah, by all, yeah. I said, by all means, uh, uh, you know, get away from the front lines by any means. So we said, yes. And uh, he took us, we, we got into, uh, into a truck and he took us to Jarny. That's Jarny, friend. So he took us to this little town of Jarny. And, uh, we were there. Now, the reason why he wanted us was uh, the Germans hated Patton and they wanted to kill him. So the German soldiers put on civilian clothing and they infiltrated the lines because they were trying to get Patton. And that was our job to make sure that Patton was uh, preserved, really. And uh, so that's why we were there. We were about Three, we had three here, and then we, there were about six more there. So we were going, but we, we never knew where his headquarters were. Again, because if we were captured and tortured, we'd probably say, well, you know, this is his head, headquarters. So they never told us where his headquarters, but we, we, we knew it was in Jarny, and we were guarding him. In fact, twice in his Jeep, he came by, and I saw him twice going by. There were only two, only two times I ever saw him. And uh, so we were, there was, there was a, a park. Yeah, here was the street and we were housed, there were buildings in here and we were here in these uh, sleeping in beds in, in, you know, with a roof over our heads and, and uh, we still had, uh, I think we were still eating K rations, but at least we were relatively safe here. And then across the street was a park that looks something like this. And then, uh, yeah. And then right here at this side, there was a post office. There was a white building with a post office and a, a window here with a, you know, like you have uh, cellar windows, they're open. Well, that's what it was, a cellar window here. And right here, there was a, uh, <laughs> that's a horse. <laughs> 
I'm, I'm not quite an artist. So anyway, there was a Frenchman here uh, uh, from World War I sitting on this metal, it was a, some kind of metal or bronze, and sitting on the horse here. And there was a little mound like in here like this. And then back here, there were big trees like this. And then back in here was a, uh, was a supply dump. And they had uh, all kinds of different supplies in there. Uh, oils and so forth, and we would we would uh, every night we'd have guards, you know, guarding here and guarding here, and we had a guard here to make sure that no none of the Germans infiltrated. So we would take turns going on uh, guard duty. So uh, the Germans again were so intent on killing uh, Patton that they had a railroad gun. And the railroad gun was probably, I don't know how many miles away, five, I don't know how far. But anyway, there was this big railroad gun. And he was, the railroad gun would fire shells into Jarny. They knew he was in Jarny. They didn't know where he was, but they were firing shells into Jarny. And, uh, uh, yeah, and here's the thing, too. Whenever, uh, uh, like an 88, when they fire uh, an 88, you hear a whining, and then the explosion. And you hear the whining noise as it went through the air. Well, when they fired this gun, it didn't make a whoa, 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 It wobbled. It was so big, see, that it, it didn't, it wobbled. And we could hear a and as soon as we hear the wobble, we knew that a shell was coming. So we duck for cover if we heard that. But we heard that wobble. And, and then after the war was over, uh, the, the, I, I read the Stars and Stripes had a picture of that gun. And oh, by the way, every time they fired, pl uh, one of the Piper uh, planes would go over to try to locate that gun. They'd go over and they'd fly over and they couldn't find it. And then they'd well, they go back. And then they'd fire again and uh, they knew that They'd send the plane over again. The plane would come over. It had to be somewhere near. It couldn't be that far away, they thought, because they, did, they didn't know that it was a, on a railroad. It was a railroad gun. See, they didn't know that. So they were looking, and they couldn't find that gun. They tried so many times and couldn't find it. And then after the war, we found out that it was a railroad gun. And what would happen is the... Uh, uh, Let's see, yeah, there was like, let's say this is, and right in here was the entrance, and the, the train would come out here with the big gun on it and fire at Jarney, and then after it fired, it would go back into this tunnel. And that's why the plane would come over and never find that gun. They never found it at all and, and until, I guess, after the, war was, uh, after the war was over. But, but, uh, one time, I was on guard duty, and uh, I, somehow or other, I didn't hear the wobble. You know, usually I hear the wobble, and then I'd run for cover. But I didn't hear the wobble this time. And, you know, I'm standing there, and all of a sudden, I heard a little bit of a wobble. It was very close, and I just, I was frozen. And the next thing I know, I saw a flash a spark, you know, it exploded. And I'm standing there, and when I saw the flash, I said, George, you're dead, yeah. because it's a huge bomb, and when it explodes, I, I said, you know, George, you're dead. And the next thing I knew, I woke up, and I was lying flat on the ground, and uh, everything was quiet. I mean, it wasn't quiet, it was still. You couldn't hear, I couldn't hear anything. There was no leaves were rattling. I couldn't hear the wind. It was just like I was inside a tomb. And uh, I was lying there, and uh, I, I was sure I was dead, because I couldn't hear. And here I am lying down, and I said, well, I'm dead. And I'm looking up, and who do you think I expected to see? Father Time. You know Father Time with the white cloak and the... I expected to see Father Time come from behind the post office and say, George, you know, follow me. Follow me yes. 
I, I don't know where I got that in my head, but that's, a, that's all I thought of, Father Time. So I'm, I'm there, and I'm waiting for Father Time to come and tell me where to go. And then I see, like, an elevator. And I said, well, he's going to take me to the elevator, and then I'll go either up or down. <laughs> Uh, and the only thing, I, the other thing, I don't know why I remember this. I could s see the top of the elevator. It, it had like an aluminum round, like shelves on it. Now, I don't know where I, I, I got that idea, but I waited and waited and waited, and I didn't see him. Nobody came to tell me where to go. So then I'm lying there, and I said, maybe, maybe I'm not dead. You know, maybe I... Maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm alive. So I start moving my arms. My I had arms and I had legs, you know. I, and so I'm moving them, and I I said, gee, maybe I'm not dead. So then I started to crawl all the way to the uh, from where I was here. I crawled. There was only about maybe 40 yards, but I crawled all the way to this uh, post office here, and I dropped into that sh uh, cellar window. And I was, to, just in case another shell came, I'd be, I'd be hidden in there. So I'm in there, and uh, I'm waiting, you know, just in case another shell comes. And then some of my guys came from, from the, across the street. They came looking for me. If, you know, after that shell, they wanted to see what happened to me. So they came looking for me, and they're looking, and, and finally they're looking here and looking here. And then they said, there he is. And, and, there was, and they saw me standing in here. And they kept running toward me. I couldn't hear anything. They were talking to me, and I couldn't hear one word they said. See, my, my, my ears were gone. In fact, they never really came back, especially my left one never really came back. My right one got better later, but I, was, I didn't hear a sound at the time. And... Uh, so then we went back, and they took me back into the house, and, and uh, they were taking good care of me. Uh, Don and I went back, by the way, you know, 51 years later, we went back to the town of Jarny. Right back to that spot. We okay. went right, yeah, right to that spot. Now, we, as we drove along, we saw some other places, some of the little parks, and I said, no, this is not it. And we saw another one. I said, this is not it. And then we came here, and I said, this looks like it, but I don't think it is because, because you know, it's, it's the same uh, shape, and there was a white building on this side, and that looked good, but there was no Frenchman sitting on a horse. <laughs> See? So, so we're here, here, we're in here, we're looking around, and then finally, a man comes in from this direction here, a Frenchman. The Frenchman, yeah. honestly. And, uh, he could speak English. Yeah, he could, yeah. And uh, this, he said, uh, you know, are, are you Montgomery? No. Uh, are, are you Phillips? No. And he thought we were aviators from World War II that he hid in his cellar. Oh. Yeah, he had, I don't know, have you had three or four? Oh, yeah. He, he, Three or four aviators he had in his cellar, you know, protecting them from the Nazis, and he thought I was one of them. And I told him, no. He, he said, you, are you sure? You know, are you sure? I said, no, I was, I was in the infantry. I wasn't, in, I wasn't a pilot. So finally he invited us to his house. So, that, that, so he took us to his house, and his wife went out and came back with delicious pastries, and we had coffee and pastries. Yes. Uh, all right, we're getting ready now for the Battle of the Bulge, all right? So I'll just start it today, and then I'll finish, try to finish it up tomorrow if I can. Okay, so here we are. Uh, let's see, let's draw a line here. And here is Bastogne. And here's the Ardennes Forest. And up here is Montgomery, I'll just call him Monty, and then Bradley. They're up here, and uh, it's, it's uh, well, let me tell you about Christmas Eve, yeah. On, 
on Christmas, you know, all the time I was in Europe, I only cried once. It was New Year's, it was Christmas Eve. And I was in a foxhole, sitting in a foxhole, and uh, by myself, and uh, thinking about my family, and they're celebrating and drinking and having cookies or cakes and so forth. It was the only night I cried. I was really very lonely. It was the loneliest night I ever had. So anyway, it was around Christmas time, and uh, uh, the Germans, it was a last gasp for the Germans because we kept pushing them back and back and back, and then Hitler said that we're going to make one last drive, and that's when he decided that he would attack in this area up in here. Now, in, uh, at the, at the remember, remember I, uh, I said uh, the Germans attacked France and, and uh, Montgomery was stuck by uh, Dunkirk and the Germans, he had them trapped in there. Well, the tanks went through the Ardennes forest beca and because it was lightly defended by the British and the French because they didn't think tanks could go through the Ardennes. Well, here we are again, and we have a light, uh, a light line along the Ardennes, and the Germans came right through the Ardennes. The same thing. We were stupid Americans and stupid British. We didn't protect that. So they barreled right through, and uh, they, they were moving in this northerly direction, and they went right in here at Bastogne, and then they took... They took they took all this, and they took all this, and Bastogne was right in the middle here. And uh, the Bastogne, the 101st uh, Airborne Infantry, were, they were in that, that town of Bastogne. And they were completely surrounded, and uh, the uh, German general sent them an ultimatum. He said, here, we'll give you a pe we'll surrender, and we'll take, uh, we'll take you peacefully back. He promised that anyway. So uh, General McAuliffe, that was his name, he was the American general in Bastogne with the, with the 100, yes? Oh, I thought you had something. Uh, yeah, he was uh, the general, and the uh, German general sent him uh, a message for him to surrender, and he said, you know, we'll treat you uh, uh, friendly. So uh, General, general McAuliffe, responded and sent him a message back. It was one word, nuts. <laughs> That's the only word he had on it. It was sure this return message. So uh, when he got it, he, he, he didn't know what it was. He said, what, what does he mean, nuts? And then one of his fellow officers said, it means that he's not going to surrender. So he went around Bastogne. Now Bastogne is a railroad town. There were a number of railroads in there. So the Germans were advancing very rapidly up into this area here. And back here, Antwerp was the port of Antwerp. Now all our supplies from England were coming to Antwerp and then they were sending the supplies down to us, to Hint, to Bradley, and to uh, Patton, and uh, it was very close. The Germans, I, the idea was for them to go through the Ardennes forest and uh, try to get to attack Antwerp and take Antwerp. If they took Antwerp, then the, uh, the supplies would have to go through Normandy, almost near Cherbourg, way out here. And it would take a long time for the supplies to reach the Americans. So it was imperative that they not take Antwerp. So. Here's Bastogne, and, uh, uh, and the German army is really plowing through here. Uh, wh while they were, they captured some Americans and, uh, in, a play in a town called Malmedy. And what they did, in Mal they, after they captured them, they were standing there in the snow, and then a truck pulled up with a machine gun in the back and slaughtered them, killed every one of them. We, we found the bodies later, and the bodies were unarmed, and they were all together in the snow, and they were just, some escaped, 
through about a, a small number of them did escape, and they explained what happened at Malmedy. So, you know, we're, we're got to, I'm sure, we're got to uh, McAuliffe, and he wasn't going to surrender. So we were, the weather was, when the weather was good, we were able to send planes over, and the planes would drop uh, food supplies, medical supplies, uh, ammunition, water, etc., and help them here. But when the weather was when the weather was bad, they couldn't get over it because you couldn't see Bastogne. So, the, but the but McAuliffe kept holding out. He refused to give up, and uh, and uh, finally, um, Eisenhower said, "We've got to go up there and relieve Bastogne." So he met with some of his generals, and uh, he said, we, have to, we, we need that relief up there. And Patton said, I'll take my men up there. He said, they, they, they said, well, he needs help. He said, I'll have my men up there in, in uh, 48 hours. They'll be, when they get there, they'll be ready to fight after 48 hours. So he was down, we were down here in the SAR. Okay, so now we were, we had to get on trucks, and we got on trucks, and we were going to head north, and Patton said, I'll have my men there in 48 hours, and when he says 48 hours, you better be there in 48 hours, because if you didn't, he'd, he'd knock off the colonels, the, uh, the majors, and, and fire all of them. He, he, when he says 48 hours, you must be there in 48 hours. So we got on trucks. Now this is, this is the middle of winter. It's about, okay, I, I'm looking, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's more like it. Okay. You know, here, here are the men in the snow, and they're, they're all dead, and you see how wintry it was. It was snowy and cold, and they were all dead. They never had a chance because uh, they machine gunned them down, and I'm sure I don't. I'm sure there were SS men doing that. They were, the Wehrmacht wouldn't. They wouldn't do that. But the S S SS wouldn't hesitate a minute to do that. Fighting in the snow. Right. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. You want to raise this up? Yeah. This just shows you, shows you in the snow. By the way, uh, many of the Germans had white fur uniforms on. We, it was hard for us to see them, but it was easy for them to see us. And we weren't, the, 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 many of the Germans, the, some of them had uh, white fur, but many of them did not. They had their regular clothing. We had our regular clothing that we wore in summertime. The only difference was they gave us a little sweater, a little woolen cap, and woolen gloves, and that was it. Same pair of pants in, that we had when we, during the summer. When you see something like this, a fire, they're nowhere near the front lines, see? Well, they're way back, miles back, and then you could start a fire, but you couldn't start, if you were a mile or two away from the front lines, you'd be dead. Okay, next. Yeah, oh, here's the other thing, too. I don't know whether I mentioned this before, but here's, uh, here's a tank area, and the, this confuses me. If you look, they're American soldiers because you can see their helmets. They're American helmets. But what confuses me is that this gun here has a flash hider on it. Now, American guns didn't have flash hiders. German guns had flash hiders. English guns had flash hiders, but not Americans. So whenever we saw a flash hider, we were running for cover or defense. And, but. Uh, but I, I can't figure it out. Uh, next one, don't I? All right, yeah, All right, next. Okay, yeah, here are some uh, German uh, s soldiers that surrendered to the Americans. Okay, yeah, here are some more. See, some had white uniforms, and then some had the dark uniforms. Okay, so here we are uh, with Patton down here, and he said he would get his men up there in 48 hours. It's the middle of winter. It's cold, as, maybe it's about 
10 or maybe 15 degrees. 20 degrees is warm. And we got on trucks, open trucks, not closed trucks, but open trucks. And we sat on benches. Uh, 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 what the trucks look like. And then we, there were benches in here. And we sat on these wooden benches. And there was no cover on the top. It was an open truck in the middle of winter. And we were riding. We would get on here and we would just sit there. And the trucks would keep going. I don't know how fast they were going, 50 miles an hour or whatever it was. But they had to get there in 48 hours. That was that. Patton said so, and they were going to get there by any means. Now, when we got on here, the trucks would go and go and go, and it's middle of winter, and uh, if you had to go, you, you just have to wait. And because they weren't going to, you know, with, with like 15 or 20 men here and 15 or 20 men here, you know, uh, you have to go at some time, but we couldn't, you know, every time a guy had to go, you can't stop because 48 hours we had to be there. So the trucks kept going, never stopped, and no matter what the men had to do. And uh, finally, uh, after a, a long time, they finally stopped, and we'd all get off and take care of whatever needs we had. And uh, we'd only stop for a brief time, very short time, and then we'd get back on the trucks again and go flying up in that car. Now, you could imagine that it's about 20 degrees, but when you're riding in an open truck with the wind going past, you know, wind chill factor, I don't know what it was, but we just sat there and just cried. Many of us, just tears were coming down our eyes. It was so painful. And we just sat and sat and sat and kept going mile after mile. We had to get up to the bulge. Then finally, at night, we stopped for one night, and uh, we got off, and fortunately, we got into some kind of a, I don't know, a house or a, I don't know, it was a big place, a big wide, maybe a, it looked almost like a huge barn. So we, we slept on a wooden floor, which was a, a uh, well, it was a novelty, really, and we were delighted to sleep on a wooden floor rather than sleeping in the ground. So uh, we had a good night's sleep, and the next morning we got up and we got on the trucks again, and the same thing. We 40, 50 miles, 60 miles an hour, and we sat on those trucks, freezing cold, and then even when you jumped off the truck, we'd stop, we'd jump off. When you hit the ground, the pain would shoot up your legs. Your legs were frozen and stiff. The pain would shoot up your legs, and we just again, get back in the truck again. And, uh, you know, I was, I was speaking to some uh, high school kids about the Battle of the Bulge, and I said, J just, just imagine this. I said, in the middle of winter, get a chair and put it out in the middle of the street you live on. Put it out in the middle of the street and sit on that chair in the middle of winter for about four or five hours and just sit in that chair, and then if you have to go to the bathroom after four or five hours, okay, but otherwise you can't. And then after you do that, you have to take a break, go back to the chair and sit in that chair for another four or five hours, and then go back into your backyard and dig a hole in your backyard and sleep in it overnight. And that's what we did. I mean, it was brutal. So, but again, Bastone needed the relief, and Patton made a promise. He said 48 hours, and we had to get there in 48 hours. So finally, the second, the second day, we finally arrived into the, in the Ardennes. And that was uh, the 48 hours. We were there in 48 hours. And we got off the trucks, and uh, we went right into the Ardennes forest. And we were ready to fight, and freezing cold. So... Uh, then that night, I don't know how we dug foxholes. We had to dig foxholes. And I don't know, up to this day, I, well, one thing we had that was far better than the Germans, the shovels. See, the Germans had shovels that looked like this. See, it, 
that had our shovels look like this. Same, the same as this, the only thing is we had a device on here that we turn so that the shovel would, could be turned at an angle like this. See? So we could then get it and hack like an ax so we could dig into the ground. Sometimes we had stony ground and we'd, use, we'd turn it this way. And then if we, the, the, the ground wasn't stony, then we'd, we'd just use it this way to dig holes. So we had to dig holes and we slept in the foxholes that night. Now this is middle of winter time and I'm in the foxhole and quite cold and then it started to snow. And I said, oh, gee, just what we need, snow. So here I am in the foxhole, cold as could be, and it's snowing. And I, you know, I'm saying, geez, I'll, I'll freeze to death, you know, you know, by morning if I stay like. So I kept moving my legs, I kept moving, to, trying to keep warm. I didn't want to freeze. And I kept moving my feet and moving my arms. And then, you, you know, you do that and you do that and you're so tired. And then finally, you can't do it anymore. And the snow is coming down. And I said, by morning, I'll be frozen to death. And they'll come here and they'll pick me up and they'll throw me in the back of a truck, frozen, stiff, and I'll be dead. And, and you know, I st started to think, you know, when you're in a position like that, you know, you can't go to the phone and call the emergency squad. You can't call the police to come and help you. You can't call your parents. They're thousands of miles away. You're alone. You're all alone there, and you have to defend for yourself. So I'm in that foxhole, and I fell asleep, and I was sure that I'd be dead the next morning. I'd be stiff. So the next morning, I woke up. I was as warm as toast. I couldn't believe how warm I was. I, I said, how can this be? Well, you know what it was? It was the snow with the, all the air holes in it. It was like an air pocket, and it stayed on me. And then my body, of, uh, my warmth of my body stayed in there. It, it didn't escape. So I was as warm as could be. And I came out of that snow. I was so happy and had my breakfast. And uh, after breakfast, we w went into the Ardennes forest again. Now, another thing, too. When I went into the army, a group of us left, like a, oh, about 50 or 60 of us left, and we went to different parts of the country. Some went to, I went to Kentucky, some people went to Texas, but there was one fellow from my neighborhood. His name was Frank Papiani. He, he, was, with, he was with me in Kentucky, and we went overseas. We went, we went in, I got into the 90th Infantry Division. He did too. I was in the... Uh, uh, I was in the, an infantry company. He was in a heavy weapons company, and he always carried a machine gun. The machine gun was almost, he was only about 5'3 or 5'4. He was this little guy, and he had this big machine gun, and he was the only one that I knew. So we got into the forest that morning, and uh, uh, there was a, a light German tank, oh, about... 200 or 300 yards in front of us, and we were in the forest, and I was telling my group, I was, so I'm saying, move, move to the left, keep moving to the left, keep, and then I hear this big voice, no, oh, come on, guys, no, oh, guys, keep, keep moving over there. And I look over, and I see, who's that big mouth? And it was Frank Papiani. Oh, Jesus. So, so he, he looked, I, I said, Frank, he looked, he says, my, he called me Chip, they call me Chip. Chip, he says, Guess what I have? And he reached in his jacket and he pulled something out of his jacket. If I gave you a hundred guesses, you'd never guess what he pulled out of his jacket. A jar of raviolis. A jar, his mother sent him a jar of raviolis. And, and, and he said, he says, Chip, he says, you know, he said, he was, we were going for the tank on this side, he was going on this side. He said, when we get to Bastogne, because the next day we knew we were going to make Bastogne, he said, when we get to Bastogne, we'll eat the raviolis. And I said, great, Frank. And then he moved with his guys, and finally we got a bazooka man to come up. He 
fired his bazooka and knocked out the tank, and we didn't worry about the tank anymore. And we dug foxholes that night and slept in the foxholes. And then the, the next day, we did, we marched right into Bastogne. We didn't fight our way in. There was, uh, I think the 4th Division got there before us. And my friend Frank got there before I did. The day, in fact, he, it took us two days to get there. It took him one day. But when he got there, <laughs> they ate all the raviolis. <laughs> so, so, so we didn't have any, any bra raviolis. Okay. All right. Well, okay, question. No question. A lot of frostbite. A lot of guys had frostbite. Oh, many, many. With, to, well, I'll say almost, I'd say 80, 90 percent got trench feet. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that trench feet, we still have it today. Uh, and that's what part of our disability is. And uh, I don't know, later on, I'll tell you about. Some of the other, after we left the, uh, the bulge, we got into, uh, after short, wasn't after, shortly after that, we got almost into Germany. So I think we'll stop right here. Lenny, last question, okay. I'll see you guys we'll tomorrow. We'll continue with the bulge tomorrow. Yes.